Hello everyone and welcome to the concluding lecture on saturated heterocycles. We have talked about the structure of saturated heterocycles, particularly with regard to stereoelectronic control over conformation, and before that we looked at some of their reactions. We will now look at how to make saturated heterocycles. You should remember from the chapter on electrophilic addition to alkenes that epoxides can be formed when treating an alkene with a peroxy acid. Nevertheless, by far the most important way of making saturated heterocycles is by ring closing reactions since we can use the heteroatom as the nucleophile in an intramolecular substitution or addition reaction. Ring closing reactions are, of course, just the opposite of the ring opening reactions we talked about earlier and we can start with a reaction that works well in both directions, ring closure to form an epoxide. The same method can also be used to generate larger cyclic ethers. Oxetane, for example, is made by adding 3-chloropropyl acetate to hot potassium hydroxide. The first step in this reaction is the hydrolysis of the ester. The alkoxide produced then undergoes an intramolecular substitution reaction to yield oxetane. Tetrahydroprin was prepared as early as 1890 by a ring closure that occurs when a mixture of 1,5-pentanediol with sulfuric acid is heated. These are all SN2 reactions, so you will not be surprised that nitrogen heterocycles can be prepared in the same way. Aziridine itself, for example, was first prepared in 1888 from 2-chloroethylamine. Related reactions can be used to form 3, 5, and six-membered nitrogen heterocycles, but normally fail to form four-membered rings. In fact, four-membered rings are generally among the hardest of all to form. To illustrate that, the green column of the table here shows the rates relative to six-membered ring formation at which bromoamines of various chain lengths cyclize to saturated nitrogen heterocycles. To convince you that these numbers mean something in the orange columns are shown the relative rates for another ring-closing reaction. This time forming 4 to 7-membered rings by intramolecular alkylation of a substituted malonate. Although the numbers are quite different in the two cases, the ups and downs are the same, and the final column summarizes the relative rates. Rough guide to the rate of formation of saturated rings is as follows. We show the numbers in color to highlight the fact that this seemingly illogical ordering of numbers actually conceals two superimposed trends. Once you get to five-membered rings, the rate of formation drops consistently as the ring size moves from normal to medium-sized rings. Small rings insert into the sequence after six-membered rings. The reason for the two superimposed trends is two opposing factors. Firstly, Small rings form slowly because forming them introduces ring strain. This ring strain is there even at the transition state, raising its energy and slowing down the reaction. The activation energy for forming a three-membered ring is very high, due to strain, but decreases as the ring gets larger. This explains why three- and four-membered rings do not fit straightforwardly into the sequence. But if the reaction rate simply depended on the strain of the product, the slowest reaction would be the formation of the three-membered ring, and six-membered rings, which are essentially strain-free, would form fastest. Yet the data shows that four-membered rings form more slowly than three-membered ones, and five-membered rings faster than six-membered. To explain this, we need to remind you the following equation. The activation energy barriers of our reactions are made up of two parts, an enthalpy of activation, delta H, which tells us about the energy required to bring atoms together against the strain and repulsive forces they usually have, and an entropy of activation, delta S, which tells us about how easy it is to form an ordered transition state from a wriggling and randomly rotating molecule. The activation energy barriers for three- and four-membered ring formation is large because the enthalpy of activation is large, energy is needed to bend the molecule into the strained small ring conformation. The enthalpy of activation, delta H, for five, six, and seven-membered rings is smaller. The second factor is one that depends on the entropy of activation, delta S how much order must be imposed on the molecule to get it to react. 
Think of it this way, a long chain has a lot of disorder, and to get its ends to meet up and react means it has to give up a lot of freedom. So, for the formation of medium and large rings, the entropy of activation is large and negative, contributing to large activation energy barriers and slow reactions. For three-membered rings, on the other hand, the reacting atoms are already very close together and almost no order needs to be imposed on the molecule to get it to cyclize. Rotation about just one bond is all that is needed to ensure that the amine group is in the perfect position to attack the antibonding orbital of the carbon bromide bond. The entropy of activation, delta S, is very small for three membered rings, while the enthalpy of activation, delta H, is large, so cyclization is relatively fast. Four membered rings suffer the worst of both worlds. Forming a four-membered ring introduces ring strain and requires order to be imposed on the molecule. They form very slowly as a result. Seven-membered rings and beyond form more slowly as the entropy of activation increases significantly. We have discussed the rate at which rings form, in other words, the kinetics of ring formation. However, there are many ring-forming reactions that are under thermodynamic and not kinetic control. For example, you have already seen that glucose exists predominantly as a six-membered ring in solution. It could also exist as a five-membered ring, it does not because although five-membered rings form faster than six-membered ones, they are usually less stable. Remember, a six-membered ring is essentially strain-free. For similar thermodynamic reasons, it does not exist as a seven-membered ring, even though you can draw a reasonable structure for it. Thermodynamic control is important in other ways in carbohydrate chemistry because control over ring size allows selective protection of the hydroxyl groups of sugars. Compare these two reactions. Both of them give acetals from the same starting material, mannitol. The important thing is that acetone reacts with mannitol to form three five-membered acetals while benzaldehyde forms only two six-membered acetals. This is quite a common result, when there is a choice, acetone prefers to react across a 1,2-diol to give a 5-membered acetal, while aldehydes prefer to react across a 1,3-diol to form a 6-membered acetal. Drawing a conformational diagram of the product on the right helps to explain why. All of the substituents are equatorial, making this a particularly stable structure. Now imagine what would happen if acetone formed this type of six-membered ring acetal. There would always be an axial methyl group, and the six-membered rings would be less stable. The rate of ring formation is affected not just by ring size but by substituents on the ring being formed. Compare the following relative rates for epoxide-forming cyclization reactions. The substrate on the right looks as though it suffers more steric hindrance but nonetheless the cyclization is tens of thousands of times faster. Adding substituents to other ring-forming reactions also makes them faster, in these examples the products are oxetanes and pyrolidines. This effect is quite general and is known as the Thorpingold effect after the first chemists to note its existence, in 1915. The Thorpingold effect is the way in which substituents on the ring increase the rate, or equilibrium constant, for ring-forming reactions. In other words, more substituents mean more cyclized product at equilibrium. The Thorpingold effect is both a kinetic and a thermodynamic phenomenon. If you measure the bond angles of chains of carbon atoms, you expect them to be close to the tetrahedral angle, 109.5 degrees. The crystal structure of the 1,3-dicarboxylic acid, for example, shows a carbon-carbon-carbon bond angle of 110 degrees. Now imagine adding substituents to the chain. They will repel the carbon atoms already there, and force them a little closer than they were, making the bond angle slightly less. X-ray crystallography tells us that adding two methyl groups to our 1,3-dicarboxylic acid decreases the bond angle by about 4 degrees. We can assume that the same is true in the alcohol starting materials for the epoxide forming reactions. Now consider what happens when both of these alcohols form an epoxide. The bond angle has to become about 60 degrees, 
which involves about 50 degrees of strain for the first epoxide, but only 46 degrees of strain for the second. By distorting the starting material, the methyl groups have made it slightly easier to form a ring. However, this part of the argument works only for small rings. For larger rings, we need another explanation, and it involves entropy. We will use the pyrrolidine forming reaction as an example. We have explained the effect of entropy of activation on the rate of ring formation. As larger rings form, they have to lose more entropy at the transition state, and this contributes to a less favorable activation energy barrier. But, when the starting material has more substituents, it starts off with less entropy anyway. More substituents mean that some conformations are no longer accessible to the starting material. The green arcs on the structures on the right show how the methyl groups hinder rotation of the nitrogen and C2-bromide substituents into that region of space. Of those fewer conformations, many approximate to the conformation in the transition state, and moving from starting material to transition state involves a smaller loss of entropy. In other words, Increased substitution favors ring closure even under thermodynamic control. Nearly all of the cyclization reactions that we have discussed have been intramolecular SN2 reactions where one end of the molecule acted as the nucleophile displacing the leaving group on the other end. We kept to this sort of reaction in order to make valid comparisons between different ring sizes. But you can imagine making saturated heterocycles in plenty of other ways. Intramolecular substitution at a carbonyl group, for example, such as happens in this lactinization reaction, or intramolecular addition of an alkoxide onto an alkyne. Cyclization reactions can be classified by a simple system involving, the ring size being formed, whether the bond that breaks as the ring forms is inside or outside the new ring, and whether the electrophile is an sp, sp2, or sp3 atom. This system places three of the cyclizations just shown in the following classes. The ring being formed has three members, the breaking carbon heteroatom bond is outside the new ring and is exo, the carbon carrying the leaving group is a tetrahedral atom abbreviated as tet. This system places the first cyclization as three exotetrahedral. The ring being formed has five members, the breaking carbon-oxygen bond is outside the new ring and is exo, the carbon being attacked is a trigonal atom abbreviated as trig. This system places the second cyclization as 5 exotrigonal. The ring being formed has six members, the breaking carbon-carbon triple bond is inside the new ring and is endo, the carbon being attacked is a diagonal atom abbreviated as dig. This system places the third cyclization as 6 endodiagonal. The classes of cyclization reactions are important because which class a reaction falls into determines whether or not it is likely to work. Not all cyclizations are successful, even though they may look fine on paper. The guidelines that describe which reactions will work are known as Baldwin's rules, which are empirical observations backed up by some sound stereoelectronic reasoning. Reactions can be classified according to these rules as favored and disfavored. We will deal with the rules step by step and then summarize them in a table at the end. Firstly, and not surprisingly all exotetrahedral cyclizations are favored. These include intramolecular SN2 nucleophilic substitutions, and we have seen many examples in this lecture. Despite the variation in rate, we have described for this type of reaction, exotetrahedral cyclizations have no stereoelectronic problems. The lone pair of the nucleophile and the antibonding sigma orbital of carbon leaving group bond can overlap successfully irrespective of ring size. Similarly, all exotrigonal cyclizations are favored. These include intramolecular esterification and related reactions. For exotrigonal reactions it is easy for the nucleophilic lone pair to overlap with the antibonding pi orbital of carbon heteroatom double bond. Again, you can find many examples in your lecture notes. Endotetrahedral reactions would not actually make a ring. Here is a reaction that looks as though it contradicts what we have just said. 
The arrows and the reasonable looking mechanism on the right describe a six endotetrahedral process because the breaking methyl oxygen bond is within the six membered ring transition state, even if no ring is formed. But Eskenmoser showed that, for all its appeal, this mechanism is wrong. He mixed together the starting material for the reaction above with the hexadeuterated compound shown below and reran the reaction. If the reaction had been intramolecular, the products would have contained either no deuterium or six deuteriums. In the event, the product mixture contained about 25% of each of these compounds, with a further 50% containing three deuteriums. The products cannot have been formed intramolecularly, and this distribution is exactly what would be expected from an intermolecular reaction. 3, 4, and 5 endotrigonal cyclizations are disfavored, 6 and 7 endotrigonal reactions are favored. The most important case in the endotrigonal class is the disfavored 5 endotrigonal reaction and, if there is one message you take away from this section, it should be that 5 endotrigonal reactions are disfavored. The reason we say this is that 5 endotrigonal cyclizations are reactions that look perfectly fine on paper, and at first sight it seems quite surprising that they won't work. This intramolecular conjugate addition, for example, appears to be a reasonable way of making a substituted pyrrolidine. But this reaction does not happen. Instead, the amine attacks the carbonyl group in a favored 5 exotrigonal cyclization. The problem is that the nitrogen's lone pair has problems reaching around to the antibonding pi orbital of the Michael acceptor. There is no difficulty reaching as far as the electrophilic carbon in the plane of the substituents. The problem is that the nucleophile must bend out of the plane if it is to overlap with the antibonding pi orbitals of the methylene carbon. However, when it bends out of the plane, it moves too far away from the electrophilic carbon to react. The nucleophile is like a dog chain just out of reach of a bone. It is easier to see this with a model, and if you have a set of molecular models, you should make one to see for yourself. Lengthen the chain, though, and the dog gets his dinner. Here is a perfectly straightforward 6 endotrigonal cyclization, for which orbital overlap presents no problem. With tetrahedral and trigonal cyclizations, exo attack of the nucleophile is better than endo attack. With diagonal cyclizations, the reverse is true. The final rule we should discuss here is that all endodiagonal cyclizations are favored. Even four endodiagonal reactions work. Here is an example of five endodiagonal cyclization. We warned you to look out for five endotrigonal reactions because they are disfavored even though on paper, they look fine. Now the alert is the other way round. We expect you would agree that this endodiagonal reaction looks awful on paper, the linear alkyne seems to put the electrophilic carbon well out of reach of the nucleophile, even further away than in the 5 endotrigonal reaction. The important thing with endodiagonal cyclizations, though, is that the alkyne has two antibonding pi orbitals, one of which must always lie in the plane of the new ring, making it much easier for the nucleophile to get at. Baldwin's rules work because they are based on whether orbital overlap can be readily achieved in the conformation required at the transition state. Baldwin's rules can be summarized in a chart. You should note the general outline of this chart, commit to memory that, broadly speaking, endotetrahedral and endotrigonal cyclizations are disfavored, exotetrahedral and exotrigonal reactions are favored, and the reverse is true for diagonal cyclizations. In this lecture, we have delved into a wide array of concepts, using the broad subject of saturated heterocycles as a lens through which to explore various topics. This exploration has gone beyond just understanding reactivity, ring conformation, and Baldwin's rules for constructing rings. Throughout these insights, we have consistently taken into account the arrangement of atomic orbitals, a set of considerations we have termed stereoelectronic effects. We are grateful for your keen interest in the highlighted topic. Best of luck with your midterm evaluations and upcoming coursework.